While children are born ready to acquire language, the quantity and quality of exposure they receive is critical for the trajectory of their language development. For children who attend group care, the language caregivers share with infants and toddlers is essential. This section will emphasize the importance of the quantity and quality of language exposure during the first three years and explain various practices caregivers can implement to increase both the quantity and quality of the language they use with infants and toddlers. Language growth and individual differences. Language develops rapidly during the first three years of life. The figure on the screen shows growth curves for the development of toddlers' productive vocabulary between 16 to 30 months of age. On the x-axis is the age of children, and the y-axis represents how many words children produce. Each gray dot is a child's data. When you look at this chart closely, what do you notice? Did you notice the individual differences within each age group? For example, look at the spread of dots at 24 months. Even within the same age, 24 months, there is a large variability in productive vocabulary between children. At 24 months, some children have been heard to speak more than 500 or even 600 words, while many others speak less than 200 words. Also, notice that the growth curve suggests that these individual differences start early, before 16 months, and continue throughout the second year of life. Where do these individual differences in language ability come from, and do they have any long-term significance? Early individual differences in language ability does have long-term significance. For example, individual differences in language processing abilities remain stable across development, those children who were faster at processing language at 19 months continued to be faster at processing language 12 months later. For children born prematurely, children who were faster at processing language at 18 months had larger vocabulary comprehension abilities at 30 months and had higher scores on language and IQ at 54 months. By 18 months, children from higher SES backgrounds already have larger productive vocabularies and are more efficient at processing language. When these same children were followed up six months later, those with larger vocabularies and more efficient language processing skills at 18 months continued to perform at a higher level. At two years of age, children from lower SES backgrounds performed at the level of children from higher SES backgrounds did when they were 18 months old, representing a six month performance gap by age two. In summary, individual differences in language ability begin to form early in life and have the potential to lead to very different developmental outcomes later in childhood. Specifically, larger vocabularies and more efficient language processing skills in toddlerhood is related to higher performance on language, cognitive, and academic assessments in later childhood. Clearly, early individual differences in language ability are important, but where do they come from? The word gap. The individual differences in language abilities that appear early in the first three years can be partly explained by the various levels of language exposure children receive. For example, early language processing abilities are associated with the amount of language children hear as research has found that children who are exposed to less language tend to have lower language abilities. In one important study on individual differences, researchers went into families' homes once per month and recorded what children heard and said for one hour. They started doing this when the infants were nine months old, and they kept going to their homes every month until the children were three years old. During this time, the toddlers began to talk, and the scientists tracked every word that they produced. They wrote down all the words and sentences that parents said to their children. After analyzing these recordings, they found that most children started speaking around their first birthday, but some learned new words much more quickly than others did. They also found that children were better at learning new words if their parents talked to them a lot at home. Children who heard lots of language, more words, more different words, more questions, more encouraging words, and more words that describe things had bigger vocabularies than children who did not hear as much language. One important finding from the study was that children heard more language 
if they were from families with a higher socioeconomic status, SES. This relationship between family SES and the amount of words spoken to the child has become known as the word gap. Hart and Risley estimated that there is a 30 million word gap. Children from higher SES families are exposed to 30 million more words by age 3 than children from families with a lower SES. While some researchers argue that the actual word gap may be less than the 30 million words originally proposed, the word gap is nonetheless present and impactful as numerous studies have documented a difference in language exposure based on family SES. For example, the language of parents with a lower SES often use a lower diversity of words in comparison to the language of parents with a higher SES. As a consequence of these input differences, children with a higher SES background often have a larger vocabulary and more often use diverse and more advanced grammatical constructions than children from lower SES families. The idea of a word gap highlights the importance of early language exposure for positive long-term developmental trajectories. Early language experiences and abilities lead to stronger later language performance and are even related to later cognitive and academic abilities. For example, toddlers with larger vocabularies and more efficient language processing demonstrated stronger language and cognitive skills at eight years of age. While indeed family SES is related to early language differences in children, family SES alone does not reveal the full story. In one study, researchers looked at the potential factors in language growth across a group of toddlers, all from families with a low SES. Children wore a special recorder that captured the language they were exposed to throughout the day, over multiple days. Results revealed great variability in language exposure, even though the children were all from families with a lower SES. The figure on the screen charts the varied language exposure of the children. Each colored column represents one child, and the height of the column represents the number of words a child heard in a 10-hour day. The taller the bar, the more words heard by a child. Some children heard over 15,000 words in one day, while Others heard under 2,500 words in one day. This is data from just one day, but imagine the compounding effect this has over the first three years of a child's life if these daily patterns are repeated. These results move the spotlight away from SES per se, and instead shine it more specifically on the variable language experiences of children, one of which can include SES. In general, Children from families with high SES hear more language than children from families with low SES. But even within the same SES level, there are significant differences in language experience. There are also other reasons besides SES for wide ranging levels of language exposure. For example, in Senegal, cultural traditions and beliefs discourage caregivers from talking with infants and toddlers, therefore greatly restricting their language exposure. Other research shows that the quantity of words infants experience varies greatly based on how infants are placed during activities and the type of activity. Infants placed in sitting devices, such as bouncy seats, high chairs, experience fewer adult words and less consistent language exposure throughout the day. Considering various daily activities, infants were exposed to the most words during book sharing, mean of 55.91 words per minute, and grooming, mean of 56.60 words per minute, and were exposed to the least amount of words during object play, mean of 34.10 words per minute, and feeding, mean of 32.44 words per minute. Until now, we have learned that the number of words children are exposed to can vary greatly depending on factors such as SES and culture. But what does the quote-unquote typical amount of language exposure look like? To estimate how many words infants and toddlers hear across different ages, another team of researchers also used small language recorders worn by children to count the number of words infants and toddlers heard throughout the day. The figure on the screen summarizes some of their data. Take a moment to look carefully at the data. What did you notice? Consider how developmental growth in other domains, such as motor abilities, might influence the amount of words children hear. 
Did you notice that infants typically heard more words than toddlers, with the youngest infants, two to four months of age, hearing the most words? Why do you think that infants and younger toddlers are exposed to more words than older toddlers? Across two to 36 months of age, children are approximately exposed to an average amount of words between the range of 12,000 to just over 15,000. Although the difference between 12,000 and 15,000 may not seem very significant, consider how these numbers could play out over just one year. A child who is exposed to 12,000 words every day for one year would hear 4,380,000 words, but a child exposed to 15,000 words daily would hear 5,475,000 words in one year. This represents a difference of over 1 million words. It is critical to stress that while this data was recorded in the child's home environment as families move throughout their daily routines in an attempt to capture, quote, natural, end quote, language exposure, the data in no way should be interpreted as representing what may be, quote, unquote, typical language exposure for all children. The participants in the study were all monolingual English-speaking children, mostly, 66%, white, all from Denver, Colorado area, and educated with a high school GED, 26%, some college experience, 29%, and a college degree, 23%. Irrespective of these limitations, the data does provide intriguing insight into daily natural language exposure for infants and toddlers. Quality of language exposure while quantity, the sheer amount of language children are exposed to, is clearly important, research suggests that the quality of the exposure is even more important. Let's revisit the chart that showed the number of words toddlers from low SES families heard in one day. While the height of the columns represents the quantity of language exposure, the colored sections of the columns represent the quality of exposure. Some children heard lots of language spoken directly to them, like when they were talking and playing with their caregivers. This is referred to as child-directed speech. The bottom color of each column is green, representing the amount of words heard that were child-directed. Other children heard lots of language that was not directed to them, like when their caregivers were talking to each other or to other children nearby. This is referred to as overheard speech. The top color of each column is blue, representing the amount of overheard words. Distinguishing between the quality of language children are exposed to is critical. The research revealed that the toddlers who heard more child-directed language had bigger vocabularies and more efficient language processing abilities than the children who did not hear as much child-directed speech. This shows that the quality of the words caregivers use with infants and toddlers, such as child-directed speech, may be even more important than the overall quantity of language exposure. Child-directed language is just one way to think about the quality of language infants and toddlers experience. Another way to perceive language quality is through the conversational turn counts between children and adults. Turn counts are an important quality measure because they capture the critical interactive and responsive aspect of a back and forth conversation. After controlling for SES, toddlers who experienced more conversational turn counts with caregivers had higher IQ scores and language abilities later in childhood at ages 9 and 13. There are important early differences in the quantity and quality of language that infants and toddlers experience above and beyond SES. Research has found that both Quantity and quality of language exposure during the first three years of life is related to language and cognitive abilities in later childhood. While caregivers should consider increasing the quantity of language their infants and toddlers experience, focusing on various quality aspects of their language interactions is the most important. The next section will introduce various strategies that caregivers can use to improve the quantity and quality of the language they share with infants and toddlers. Strategies that support language development. Responsiveness and sensitivity. Responsiveness refers to a caregiver's ability to detect and respond to a child's behavioral signals during shared interactions. Sensitivity refers to 
caregivers who are aware and capable of understanding a child's behaviors and that respond to the child's needs in a timely and appropriate manner. Thus, responsiveness and sensitivity are related constructs that when implemented, support the language development of infants and toddlers. Infants and toddlers benefit from interacting with responsive and sensitive caregivers. For example, removing social feedback from interactions between caregivers and infants leads to fewer vocalizations from five-month-old infants. One study found that when children were nine and 13 months old, caregivers' responsiveness predicted when children reached various language milestones, such as when children produced their first words and first 50 words. Both caregiver responsiveness and sensitivity are related to the development of expressive language abilities in toddlers, and higher levels of caregiver sensitivity during infancy is related to greater abilities in language comprehension in toddlerhood. To support language development, caregivers should participate in training sessions that practice and improve their ability to provide responsive and sensitive care and interactions with infants and toddlers. When caregivers do receive such training, their responsiveness improves and is linked to an improvement in communication abilities of infants. Engaging in responsive and sensitive interactions not only takes practice, but also uninterrupted focused time with children. To be responsive, a caregiver must pay close attention to a child's signals, and to be sensitive, a caregiver must respond to their signals in a timely and appropriate way. Turn-taking. Infants spend much of their awake time in face-to-face -face interactions with their caregivers, and it is this face-to-face -face conversational setting that provides an important context for infants to start acquiring language. Additionally, before infants acquire language, they start to interact in social exchanges with caregivers, characterized by turn-taking patterns such as peekaboo games and give-and-take sequences of interaction. These mutually engaged interactions can consist of behaviors in multiple modalities such as vocalizations, gazes, and smiles. Conversational turn-taking is important during infancy as it lays the foundation for the flow and pattern of interactions but continues to be important throughout toddlerhood and the preschool years as the amount of turn-taking children and caregivers engage in is related to language development and brain function. There are many ways caregivers can engage in turn-taking with children. Questions are a common way to start back and forth conversations. Questions can have many formats, including open, involving no single correct answer and likely requiring a multiple word response, or closed, a single correct answer, with the latter including label questions, what's this called, or yes-no questions, is this a dog? There is extensive evidence that questions in a classroom are a powerful tool for eliciting child language and fostering conversation. Open-ended questions may be relatively rare, representing approximately only 5% of caregivers' prompts. Interestingly, Kid and Roland 2021 found that with two and three-year-olds, when presented with conversational opportunities, children contributed just about one-third, 37% of the turns. Caregivers can try to increase the number of turn-taking exchanges during interactions by talking about abstract, non-present concepts. Proto-conversations. Infants produce both speech-like vocalizations, such as protophones, and cries from birth. Even before infants produce their first words, Caregivers and infants show turn-taking communication patterns referred to as proto-conversation. Proto-conversations involve communicative turn-taking between caregivers and infants using a variety of communication techniques such as vocalizations, gestures, facial expressions, and language. Infants between 3 and 5 months produce more than 40% of their turns in overlap with caregivers. While this proportion of overlap decreases after five months and drops to around 20% at 18 months. Caregiver responses, verbal or nonverbal, to infant protophones most often occur within one second after infant protophones. Caregiver responses to protophones thus appear to provide a rich learning opportunity. Through proto conversation, caregivers play a key role for infants in helping them learn the turn-taking system necessary for communication. Furthermore, many longitudinal studies have shown that protophones 
are foundations for language development. In summary, early turn-taking and proto-conversations support language development by laying the foundation of back-and-forth communication and highlight the role of social interactions for supporting language development. Caregivers can use proto-conversations to support language development in the following ways. Recognize that protophones offer a special opportunity to bond with an infant and are important for the beginning development of speech. Even before an infant's vocalizations begin to sound like speech, engage with the infant in proto-conversations. A proto-conversation involves contingent, bi-directional turn-taking, so make sure you allow for time devoted to an infant where you can respond to their communication promptly and continue the turn-taking conversation. Being an engaged caregiver in the communicative partnership positively affects the quantity and quality of infant vocalizations. There are various ways to respond to infant vocalizations, including physical touch, vocalizations, speech and facial expressions. In terms of vocal and speech responses, caregivers have been found to primarily use affirmations and imitations with young infants, and then expand their responses to include expansions, descriptions, and questions as children's abilities increase. This shows that caregivers are sensitive to infant vocal capacities and respond accordingly, thereby fostering infant vocal development. Infant Directed Speech When caregivers interact with infants, their speech often takes on specific, distinguishing features in a speech register known as infant directed speech. Infant directed speech is produced by caregivers of most, although not all, linguistic and cultural backgrounds and is typically characterized by a slow, melodic, high-pitched, and exaggerated cadence. From early in life, infants tune their attention to infant-directed speech, preferring to listen to infant-directed speech over adult-directed speech at birth, as well as later in infancy. Infants' preference for infant-directed speech may play a useful role in early language learning. For example, infants are better able to discriminate speech sounds in infant-directed speech than in adult-directed speech, more efficiently segment words from continuous speech in an infant-directed speech register, demonstrate better long-term memory for words spoken in infant-directed speech, and learn new words more effectively from infant-directed speech. Overall amount of infant-directed speech and everyday speech input between 7 to 11 months is positively correlated with language outcomes at 5 years of age. And amount of infant directed speech in a one-on-one -on -one setting between 11 and 14 months of age is correlated with productive vocabulary at 24 months, as well as word production at 33 months. Singing. While infant directed speech has been extensively investigated, Research on infant-directed singing and its relationship with language development is gaining more attention. Across most cultures, caregivers naturally sing to infants throughout the day. In fact, one study captured day-long audio recordings from 35, 6 to 12-month-old infants and found that 100% of the infants heard both live and recorded music. However, not all children are exposed to singing daily. Nationally, in the U.S., only 57.4% of infants and toddlers are sung to every day. Comparing the prevalence of daily singing with infants and toddlers across the U.S., Texas had the lowest prevalence, 47.6%. Alaska had the highest, 72.3%. And California was just under the national average, 56.4%. Similar to infant-directed speech, infant-directed singing is characterized by higher pitch and slower tempo than non-infant directed versions of the same songs by the same singers. Two common types of songs for infants and toddlers include lullabies and play songs. In line with their soothing function, lullabies feature very slow tempo, low pitch, falling contours, limited amplitude variation, and soothing tone of voice, properties that are shared with soothing infant directed speech. Although play songs are commonly sung to Western infants, unlike lullabies, they are not universal, 
An example of play songs are Old MacDonald Had a Farm, Five Little Monkeys Jumping on the Bed, and The Wheels on the Bus. Research indicates that infants find infant-directed singing more engaging and prefer to listen to it compared to non-infant-directed singing. Singing lullabies to infants, even unfamiliar lullabies in an unfamiliar language, helps infants relax and enter a calmer state. Songs allow infants to capitalize on the acoustic boundary cues within song melodies to organize a continuous song into structurally relevant parts and recognize different phrases while the song unfolds. For example, six-month-old infants are able to segment children's songs into phrases. Already, before their first birthday, infants are able to recognize changes in the syllable order in songs, differentiate between rhyming and non-rhyming songs, and learn novel words reoccurring in the song lyrics. Furthermore, infant-directed singing is related to later language development. Specifically, higher levels of infant-directed singing is related to greater language comprehension abilities in infants and later language skills in toddlerhood. Early newborn neural responses to singing predicts later language development at 18 months. Even a short, one-month intervention at nine months of age was found to be associated with enhanced neural responses for temporal structure processing in both music and speech contexts compared to a control group. This research suggests that detection and prediction of auditory patterns, crucial skills for both music and speech, were positively affected by early musical activities. Similar to infant-directed speech, infant-directed singing is more engaging and has the potential to positively influence children's language development. Caregivers can take advantage of the power of singing by including singing across a range of activities. While singing to calm a child or putting them down to sleep is common, caregivers can include singing throughout daily routines and activities and create short songs in the moment. Joint attention. Joint attention refers to a shared focus between a caregiver and a child, including gaze, pointing, and visual attention. Joint attention is an important feature of language development because once joint attention is shared, the caregiver and child have a communicative context in which information about objects or events in the environment can be effectively communicated. During the child's first two years of life, joint attention is thought to emerge gradually in interaction with the child's emotional and social development, as well as resulting from cognitive development involving skills like processing, attention, and self-regulation. Already, in the first four months of life, infants start to engage with their caregivers in sustained periods of face-to-face or mutual eye gaze. Between the ages of 9 to 12 months, children start to explore their environment more. At this point, dyadic attention shifts to triadic attention, in which caregiver and child start to coordinate and systematically divide their attention between objects or events in the environment and with each other. It should be noted, however, that these episodes of triadic joint attention do not occur frequently until children are about 15 to 18 months old. Joint attention is related to language development. Children's ability to respond to bids of joint attention by their caregiver at 6, 8, 10, and 18 months of age has been reported to predict vocabulary size at 30 months of age. Interestingly, there is also some evidence suggesting that responding to joint attention may be predictive of receptive vocabulary size, and that initiating joint attention may be predictive of expressive vocabulary size. Gaze following behavior at 10 to 11 months predicted receptive vocabulary at both 14 and 18 months. Further, Full-term infants' responsiveness to gaze alterations in triadic interactions at 9 months and initiating triadic interactions at 14 months were positively correlated with later language, such that infants with more responsivity to gaze shifts had better receptive and expressive language scores at 30 months. Individual differences in responding to joint attention at 9 and 12 months and initiating joint attention at 18 months predicted expressive language at 24 months. One reason joint attention is related to language development is because shared attention toward an object 
allows for language to be more easily mapped to objects. For example, if a caregiver and an infant are jointly attending to the same object, such as a dinosaur, when the caregiver uses the word dinosaur, it creates a clear link between the object, dinosaur, and its linguistic label. Although engaging in joint attention is a natural activity for caregivers, it does require an investment of uninterrupted time to truly engage with infants and toddlers. So much of a caregiver's time can be devoted to care routines, preparation, and cleaning. It can be a challenge to set aside time for joint attention to take place. For joint attention to occur, caregivers must be fully present in their interactions with children as they share joint attention through eye gaze, visual attention, and pointing, oftentimes accompanied with physical touch and language. One study found that across 200 toddlers recorded for 20 minutes while attending group care programs, one third of the children did not engage in any joint attention with caregivers. When caregivers practice reading the communicative cues and practice engaging in joint attention with infants and toddlers, they improve in their ability to share in joint attention with children. One reason joint attention may be beneficial is that it increases the amount of time infants pay attention to something, such as an object. During moments of joint attention, caregivers can increase an infant's attention by talking about and manually manipulating the object an infant is interested in. Baby Signs and Sign Language Baby signs are gestures created to provide an early way for caregivers to communicate with infants and toddlers and acquire insight and respect for underestimated communicative abilities of children before they can talk. The baby sign system is not a full language system and is not the same as sign language. Baby signs were created as a means to ease communication as manual communication often precedes spoken language production. Baby signs are usually used while simultaneously using a spoken language and do not mark each word spoken in a sentence. For example, if a caregiver asks an infant, do you want more, the baby sign for more will be used when the spoken word more is produced, but the other words in the sentence will not be accompanied by a sign. In comparison to baby signs, sign languages are fully fledged language systems naturally created by deaf individuals. As misconceptions about sign language continue to persist, there are a few facts to know. Sign languages are complex language systems with similar linguistic properties as spoken languages. Most countries have their own sign language, such as American Sign Language in the U.S. and Lengua de Señas Mexicana in Mexico. Infants and toddlers learning a sign language as a native language show acquisition patterns and reach milestones similar to children learning a spoken language. Similar neural systems support the processing of both signed and spoken languages. After early investigations reported that very young children of deaf parents often attained early language milestones in sign language at younger ages than children learning a spoken language, other investigators began to study the learning of signs or symbolic gestures by young hearing children of hearing parents. In this research, those infants who were taught a collection of quote-unquote baby signs typically acquired the signs faster than speech-trained infants acquired a collection of spoken target words. The investigators attributed the children's slower acquisition of spoken words to the difficulties and complexities involved in spoken language production early in a child's development. In other words, a child's physical ability to produce speech or control the muscles needed for recognizable speech seems to lag behind the child's physical ability to control the arm and hand movements needed to produce recognizable signs. The children in the sign-trained group showed a long-term advantage on a number of language development measures throughout early childhood, as well as higher school-age IQ scores. These findings indicate that early signing or symbolic gesturing does not hamper verbal development and may, in fact, enhance it. In another investigation, 40 infants were followed from age 8 months to 20 months, where Half the mothers modeled signs or gestures for a limited number of target set signs, whereas the remaining half of the mothers focused on spoken language input. 
the mothers in the sign gesture input conditions became more sensitive to their infant's nonverbal cues than the mothers in the speech only condition. Numerous studies have shown that the use of baby signs is related to more responsiveness from caregivers and helps infants and caregivers to be more in sync with each other when interacting. This increased sensitivity to infants' nonverbal cues may be an important benefit of sign input, as such sensitivity may contribute to closer caregiver-infant bonding. In an attempt to explain the positive outcomes associated with baby signing in their research, Goodwin and Acredlo suggested that the children's symbolic gestures or signs may have elicited more spoken language input from the children's caregivers, as well as indicated to the caregivers the specific topics in which the children were interested in. There are, however, other possible interpretations. One is that combining sign and spoken language input may facilitate the vocal production of typically developing babies, as it does for many children with Down syndrome and autism. A third possibility is that because baby signing typically involves caregivers producing signs for only the key words in their utterances, this combining of signs and spoken language may help infants segment the speech stream by making the specific sign words more prominent, thus facilitating their acquisition. Along with the claim of potentially fostering more rapid spoken language development, the early use of signs has been associated with fewer and less severe temper tantrums in infancy and early childhood. Additional support for this claim of improved social behavior is seen in a study of hearing infants who were taught manual signs early in their lives. Once these infants acquired minimal functional sign skills, their incidence of crying and whining decrease substantially. Caregivers can easily learn basic signs and use them with infants and toddlers. Using baby signs per se is not necessary. Baby signs are based on sign languages and often require unnecessary financial purchases. Baby signs are sometimes modified to be easier to manually produce for young children, but young children natively acquire sign languages and naturally produce signs that caregivers can understand even if they are not exact replicates of the adults. Two free resources to learn signs are LifePrint, created by Dr. Bill Vickers, and the ASL Sign Bank. Shared Reading Is reading books with infants and toddlers important? Most likely, you quickly answered this question with a resounding yes. While most people might strongly agree that reading with young children is an important activity, only 37.2% of infants and toddlers nationally are read to every day. Reading is so important because it maximizes the kinds of experiences that optimally predict language learning. A study of 3,547 children between 1 to 2 years of age found that children who were read to for at least 11 minutes every day had stronger reading, spelling, and grammatical skills in both 3rd grade and 5th grade. There are at least three ways in which book reading influences language learning. First, it offers children the opportunity to hear new vocabulary items embedded in varied grammatical sentences. Books written for children use well-formed, relatively short sentences that are rich in varied vocabulary. Furthermore, books often use the same words in diverse grammatical constructions, offering implicit lessons in how words are used. The texts of books tend to have more words that are less commonly used than does spoken language, and books encourage use of a wider range of words than would occur in everyday conversations. Indeed, shared reading is a robust predictor of children's vocabulary and reading comprehension abilities. The second way in which book reading enriches children's language development is that it promotes joint attention and interest. Consider all the ways in which books help children maintain their attention. Children's books often use bold colors and strong contrasts and typically depict illustrated objects and animals that appeal to young children. The page of the book provides a clear focus for attention and unlike movable toys such as balls and trucks, books are held and remain relatively stationary. An attentive adult can 
easily notice what a child is attending to and build on it with commentary. In turn, children are able to draw an adult's attention to interesting areas of the pictures using a broad range of cues, including gestures, sounds, and words. Thus, attention can be managed by the child as well as the adult. Finally, book reading helps children learn language because it requires the participants, both caregiver and child, to be active and engaged in responsive interactions about word meanings. It is an opportunity for a caregiver to focus on the child and make efforts to be responsive to their interests. When caregivers and young children communicate during book reading and move away from the text, they are engaging in a language-rich activity that yields even more varied vocabulary and diverse sentence structures. Dialogic reading occurs when adults follow the child's interest and engage in conversation about material on the printed page or about experiences the child has had that relate to the story. Book reading becomes an up-close and personal experience when done this way and yields the most in the way of language learning. Additionally, the frequency of shared reading, the age at which caregivers begin to read to children, and repeated reading of books are important factors that further the benefits of shared reading for language development. The importance of reading frequency for children from birth to age three is clearly revealed by numerous studies. Just reading one picture book every day can lead to an increase of approximately 78,000 words each year. Findings of a large study revealed that caregivers' reports of daily book reading at age 14 months related to vocabulary and language comprehension at 14 and 24 months. A longitudinal study focused on 1,046 children examined language and cognitive abilities at 14, 24, and 36 months of age. Literacy experiences at each of the three ages was related to language and cognitive skills at three years of age. There was also evidence that the age at which caregivers begin to read to children is important. One observational study found that children in households where reading was reported with children as young as eight months of age had stronger early language growth. An intervention study compared the effects of interactive reading when infants were four months old and when infants were eight months old. Only the condition with older infants at eight months of age was effective, with improved language abilities being found when the children were 12 and 16 months old. Repeated readings of the same books can also increase children's engagement and enhance their language learning through shared reading. Children who read a familiar book talk more than when reading a novel book. Moreover, caregivers and children talk more about related content or their own experiences when rereading the same book, which also increases children's world knowledge. For children with lower language abilities, repeated readings of the same book increase engagement in comparison to readings of different books. Repeated readings provide multiple opportunities for repeated imitation and processing of novel words in a meaningful context, as books contain more unique words compared to child-directed speech. Experimental studies have found that children's expressive vocabulary is enhanced after two or more readings of the same book, whereas one reading often does not result in significant vocabulary gains. Dialogic reading. Imagine you are sitting down to read a book with a toddler. You open the book and the image on the screen shows what is on the first page. Take a moment to look at the image and consider how you would read this page with a toddler. For many of us, we read books with children by focusing on the text. Reading the words on the pages is a great start, but there can be so much more to discuss. Variation in how books are read and discussed has been found to be important. Ninio, 1980, examined interactions between Israeli caregivers and infants between 17 and 22 months of age. Caregivers tended to use one of three interactional routines, asking one of two types of questions, what's that, where's that, or simply naming things. A large study of the reading approaches of 126 caregivers found variability in how they read to children at age 7 and 24 months. Caregiver reading style was related to language growth, with children showing greater language growth 
when they were encouraged to participate in the reading and supported in their understanding. However, this reading style was found in only 30 of the 126 caregivers. One of the most common methods to improve caregivers' reading with young children is dialogic reading, as it is not commonly implemented when caregivers read with infants and toddlers. To encourage caregivers to see that reading should be about more than just the words on pages, reading with infants and toddlers is best perceived as an interaction between the caregiver, the child, and the book. Perceiving the book reading as more of an interaction is oftentimes referred to as dialogic reading. Dialogic reading uses techniques that encourage the caregiver to be responsive to the child with conversations that follow the child's interest and lead. Dialogic reading typically involves recasts, expansions, and open-ended questions, all of which have been shown to have a positive impact on a child's language development. A meta-analysis of dialogic reading found that it loses its value with older children. It may be that this method is best suited to book reading with infants, toddlers, and younger preschool children. One reason dialogic reading is so beneficial for children's language development is because it involves quality language-boosting practices. For example, the child-directed speech delivered during interactive shared book reading contains higher levels of syntactic and lexical diversity than the speech children are exposed to during play-based activities, and high levels of syntactic and lexical diversity in speech directed to children are linked to higher levels of syntactic and lexical diversity in children's speech. Interactive shared book reading has also been shown to foster higher levels of joint attention, responsiveness, and contingent talk, all of which have been shown to support language development. It also encourages the caregiver to use additional language boosting practices, which have all been shown to support children's language development, including expanding, recasting, and asking open-ended questions. Many studies that have trained caregivers in dialogic reading strategies report positive gains in young children's language outcomes. For example, one study trained teachers to read using a dialogic reading style that involved asking more open-ended questions and responding to children's attempts to answer these questions with low-income Mexican toddlers. Children who received a dialogic reading intervention scored significantly higher on measures of both expressive and receptive language than children in the control group. Many studies have found that asking basic comprehension questions during shared reading increases the effects on oral language skills in comparison to reading storybooks aloud without asking questions. Asking such comprehension questions both serves to attain joint attention and to establish a fundamental understanding of concepts and events. Discussing the meanings of new words in the context of the story and in other contexts facilitates a deeper word understanding. By implementing the P-E-E-R, peer, sequence, the caregiver prompts the child to say something about the book, evaluates the child's response, expands the child's response, and repeats the prompt to help the child learn from the expansion. A fundamental element of dialogic reading is the use of prompts to begin the peer sequence while reading with a child. The acronym CROWD stands for five recommended prompts. Completions, example, five little monkeys jumping on the... The child fills in bed to participate in completing the thought. Recalls, example, what happened after the wolf huffs and puffs? The child recalls the story and puts that into their own words. Open questions. Example, tell me what is happening in this picture. The child practices putting their own thoughts into words. WH questions. Examples, what is that? Why is that happening? At many different levels, children can put their thoughts into words. Distancing questions. Example, what happened when we made your birthday cake? Children remember past events and relate them to the present and future. Let's take another look at the page from a children's book presented earlier. Imagine creating an interaction with the child about this page using the peer and or crowd dialogic reading strategies. After imagining what you might say using the dialogic reading strategies, 
reflect on how the quantity and quality of your language was impacted. Conclusion Language develops rapidly during the first three years of life, and the quantity and quality of language exposure is important not only for later language development, but also for later cognitive and academic outcomes. Caregivers play an essential role in exposing children to a high quantity and high quality of language and can use many strategies to improve their ability to do so.